Uh, so the resolution obviously is in boss. Uh, this is the your con, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is con, um, Mr. R. A. David Mason, and um, catch me playing ultimate frisbee with you guys later. Yeah. And uh, James Chen, and then on the pro speaking second we have. Keshav is the first speaker, and Max as the second speaker. Um, <laughs> that kid Keshav is the first speaker. Yeah, because they're the speaking seconds. Oh, thank you. Second speaking team, con pro. So we have the sides reversed to how they're traditionally um, listed. And I'll be moderating throughout the debate. So after um, every, I'd say after the first crossfire, and then after the second, or after both rebuttals, uh, we'll stop very momentarily to talk about some of the speeches and some of the things going on in the debate to clarify some things and maybe answer some questions, maybe uh, critique. Uh, James's rebuttal, or Max's rebuttal, Maybe or uh, advice. yeah, because you'll probably need it in this debate. Okay. Oh. Fun fact: If you guys make fun of me, I won't pick you to be on my team later for Ultimate Frisbee Five Football. <laughs> so sad. That's it. Yeah, no. That's it. That's All right. With that, does anyone have any questions? All right. Cool. Let's get started. You guys ready? Gate resolved, the United States should accede to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea without reservations. Contention 1 is flaming the fire. Currently, America is making progress on de-escalating conflict in the South China Sea. Joining UNCLOS would only put more fire to the fury of China for two reasons. The first is forcing China into a corner. The Council on Foreign Relations explains that UNCLOS has a court, known as a tribunal, which remediates territorial disputes. In the South China Sea, the tribunal's rule would be to determine whether China's claims were legitimate and if their island building was legal under international law. Turning to the tribunal as a means of resolving territorial disputes is bad because if China loses, they're forced to posture in order to save face. The result is increased militarization in the South China Sea. Mitchell from Ohio State University conducted an analysis of the history of UNCLOS dispute settlements and concluded that UNCLOS dispute agreements doubled the chance of militarization. Second is undercutting future diplomacy. Foreign Policy Magazine explains that it would be highly difficult for the tribunal to assess the claims of China over various contested maritime features merely in terms of their status as geological features under UNCLOS. This is because when UNCLOS was conceived, there were no rules regarding the legality of constructing islands in the sea. Consequently, China has made claims that UNCLOS is an invalid mechanism for resolving these disputes, and they have since ignored the tribunal rulings. When diplomacy fails, the success of future diplomacy is undercut. Greg of the University of North Texas writes, Repeated diplomatic failure will sour the parties on future invitations, convincing them that such actions are a waste of time as their differences become irreconcilable. The impact of tensions is conflict. Slate's Eric Posner <coughs> elaborates, due to the unprecedented, nu unprecedented number of alliances and interests involved, island disputes in the South China Sea are the most likely starting place for World War III. If conflict broke out, America would be pulled into a devastating war, resulting in millions of deaths. Contention 2 is cracking open a cold one. Garner 12 of the ASP cooperates this by saying, companies have expressed their need for the maximum level of legal certainty before they will or could make substantial investments in Arctic exploration. He concludes that companies won't drill in the Arctic until they are backed by the legal framework of UNCLOS. However, if the US joins, Ryan finds that the United States claim under Article 76 would add an area in the Arctic equal to the area of West Virginia. The impacts are twofold. First, Mead 18 of Vox finds that with expensive, risky, deep drilling and harsh seas will come inevitable oil spills, concluding that there aren't enough resources in place for spill response. Unfortunately, Part 617 of the Ocean Conservancy writes that these oil spills would, it would um, impact indigenous communities which rely heavily on food from a healthy ocean. Second is climate change. Business Insider reports that the Arctic contains 90 billion barrels of oil and a fourth of worldwide natural gas resources. The process of extracting and burning these resources would emit a significant amount of methane and CO2, accelerating the process of global warming. Indeed, Greenpeace 15 reports that US Arctic drilling will lead to at least five degrees of warming by 2100. The impact of global warming fall primarily on poor developing countries. 
as changing weather patterns destroyed the livelihoods of farmers reliant on agriculture as a means of sustenance. Thus, Whiteman 13 reports that this will add an extra $60 trillion cost to developing countries and adds the world can expect 7.4% less food yields per degree of Celsius warming. As a result, Barons of the GCG says that an increase in temperature past two degrees means billions of people are forced into starvation. Thus, we negate Tension is calming the waters. Conflict is brewing in the Asia Pacific. Frankie of the Emory Law Review explains UNCLOS has created a battle of interpretations between China and the US. America's reading of UNCLOS is lenient, giving countries total freedom over navigation and commerce. On the other hand, China's interpretation is stringent and protectionist. It believes that other countries, such as the US, don't have the right to conduct military operations in their exclusive economic zones and building up artificial islands in the ocean to extend its territorial landmass. While the islands are hundreds of miles from China's mainland, Frankie argues that Beijing claims that these, ro these waters have belonged to China since ancient times, claims which grossly overlap with the widely accepted maritime rights of other countries. Catherine Wong of the South China Morning Post continues in 2018, Beijing's island construction program has resulted in a network of intelligence gathering and defense abilities in the South China Sea. Coupled with its increasingly restrictive control over ocean navigation, Wong writes that the balance of power in the region is shifting between the hegemons. Whereas the South China Sea was once dominated by the U.S. 7th Fleet, China's navy is now starting to challenge that authority. She furthers that the risk of miscalculation in armed conflict is rising to dangerous levels as the United States is poised to send, send its aircraft carriers to Vietnam for the first time in over 50 years. There are two existing sources of insecurity that a ratification of UNCLOS could mitigate. First, signaling confidence. Tong of the University of the Pacific explains in the 1980s, the United States led negotiations that shaped the modern law of the sea. However, by failing to then ratify the treaty, America effectively surrendered its role in the rulemaking affairs of the oceans to China. According to this detail of the Naval Law Review, China has exploited our absence to push its agenda, criticizing the U.S. as a self-serving and disingenuous superpower which aims to extract the benefits of UNCLOS while avoiding membership due to its distrust of the international community. This narrative has caused nations to lose faith in a global rules-based order. The tall confirms the weak state of law and order at sea has driven many countries into paranoia. States with vulnerable coasts and small fleets, such as Thailand, South Korea, and Vietnam, might perceive UNCLOS as a securitization norm as more attractive than the current accepted norms of robust military cooperation and unrestricted innocent passage through territorial waters. Fortunately, Hauk of the University of Washington explains ratification would rehabilitate the image of the U.S., often accosted by other states, for despising international law. Were America to accede to the UNCLOS, it would flip the current dynamic, which seems to increasingly favor coastal state control and militarization over the freedom of navigation and commerce. Second, organizing multilateral efforts. The Truman Center for National Policy indicates as China continues to expand its territorial claims with Taiwan, Malaysia, and the Philippines, it relies on economic muscle to prevent other South China Sea nations from collectively bringing claims under the treaty and instead takes on each claimant member nation individually. If the United States were to accede to UNCLOS, it could use its legal standing under the treaty of our own economic muscle to prevent China from pushing its neighbors around. Gates of the diplomat writes, if the United States is the only actor in the world with the power, resources, and relationships necessary to diffuse tensions and bring about an enduring solution grounded in international law. Fortunately, French of the Atlantic concludes, the more China sees a coordinated response to its military buildup, the more likely it will be to turn towards diplomacy and to stop seeking overwhelming superiority in the region. None of the South China Sea countries have any prospect of prevailing toe-to-toe -to -toe with China, but co in concert they may, be able be, they may be able to effectively tie down the giant and constrain it to a mutually acceptable sea of international rules. The impact of decreasing tensions is trade. 
If the chance of conflict is high, confident in the security of shipping routes fails as businesses and traders choose to take longer routes or forego shipping altogether. In a 23-year analysis of news coverage on Asian relations, Tang of Peking University verifies that a 1% increase in tension score leads to a 0.05 decrease in trade. This is devastating because the CSIS finds that over $5 trillion, or 30% of all global trade, flows through the South China Sea each year. More specifically, Schofield of the Conversation observes that economic activity in the South China Sea is fundamental to the food security of coastal populations numbering in the hundreds of millions. Even slight changes in trade will affect food prices for countless people. Thank you, and we have <laughs> Okay, so before first crossfire, let's talk about the cases. So, does anyone have any initial thoughts about um, either side's cases? Yes. Uh, both mentioned both mentioned and uh, impacted out to food security, so it could be a question of who better links into food security. Yes. So both teams, uh, especially with both like the cons first contention and the pros mono contention, both link in and talk about not only China and the South China Sea and uh, East Asian and Southeast Asian conflict. But um, the pros impact also matches up well with the second contention's second impact on the con. Um, so this could make for a very interesting comparative debate in terms of not only weighing, but also seeing which side is probably more true, potentially more immediate, um, and doing some weighing there, not only on the impact level, but also on the link level, which is something that most debaters predicted to do during the debate. Does anyone else have any initial thoughts? Anyone? All right. Who thinks just so far, just based on hearing the cases, who right now would want to vote for the con? Yes. And who here would want to vote for the pro? Yes. It's a binary. Okay, so anyone who didn't raise their hand is probably making the right decision because it's never, but it, it, is, it is too early to determine <laughs> who Right? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, 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 Obviously, they're not true. Uh, both my uh, No, it's good. it's good to be following out throughout the debate round who you think might win the debate as a judge and potentially as a competitor as well, um, gaining that insight as to who has the stronger case out of the gate, not only in terms of impact, but in terms of how strategically aligned they are to the other side's case and how it can be used as a tool to refute the other team's case um, is very good to keep track of and very good str um, strategic in terms of being able to think uh, within the round in terms of how you could apply your case against theirs and vice versa in predicting different teams' movements. Just remember, debate is a game. With that, let's go to first classifier. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, we're running short on time, Alex. We might need to cut down those uh, moderations. I have a question? Yeah. All right, so is your first warrant about signaling confidence dependent on UNCLOS being a good form for diplomacy? Um, no. Why not? Because the warrant, more generally, is that once we accede to UNCLOS, those other countries will then have a reason to bring the U.S. to the table. So even if the tribunals and like actual frameworks provided by UNCLOS are not particularly great, as you talk about in your case, the fact that the U.S. is at the table hey, still makes things better. Hold on, but what we would say, the problem with that is you're not going all the way down the link chain. If you see failed diplomacy, we say that's the strongest link Look, to signaling okay. confidence I'm gonna answer, in I'm going to answer that question, but then I'm going to take a question, okay? So, yeah. so yeah. you think that... There, like failed diplomacy coming out of tribunals is bad, but yes. we are going to argue that there is diplomacy coming outside of tribunals as well that can be successful. Sure. Now, the question I'm going to ask is about China as well. Yes. You say that us acceding to UNCLOS makes China mad. What has China vociferously come out and told the U.S. to do? I mean, we don't necessarily say that China acceding makes the United States mad. That's not like our I mean, the other way around, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We don't <laughs> that, we don't read that as a link. Okay, so then what is the link? Uh, well, we read two links. The first link is that the tribunal ruling is black and white, which means that China either wins or they lose. And okay. we say they're probably gonna lose. And yeah. it's when they lose, that is where we link into yeah, our yeah. Bill So how, how does the US acceding have to do with that? Oh, we say that right now, China doesn't take any form of diplomacy seriously without the United States being there. Because we kind of carry the torch in terms of diplomacy in the South China That's Sea. That's my point. Yes, yeah. So we say that when the United States carries the torch, 
into a dark cave, and then the torch goes out in that cave, everybody okay. loses faith in our ability okay, to Okay, okay, so if, if we just prove that we don't go to tribunals first and just do things outside of the union close framework, can we access Wait, diplomacy? So why would we, we need to, to agree on, on the first why part would of the we, Why would we need to accede to Bloom close in order to engage in multilateral diplomacy? <coughs> because right now, other countries like Indonesia and the Philippines don't listen to the economic weight that the U.S. has because they are just scared that China will, like, so, you know, change what's allowed in their EZs. So, so your entire argument is contingent upon the fact that these countries, according to your case, are deathly afraid of China, but they won't work with the United States because we haven't signed a treaty that no one really takes seriously. Well, they do take the treaty seriously, the countries that are scared of talking to us. Well, you just told me that they, well, I, well James can read you evidence that says they support China's competing interpretations. Okay, that that's, with the that's also my point, which is that <laughs> we want them to support our interpretation. So why would us exceeding uniquely change their perspective? Because we can talk to them. That's not like a good reason. Like they can still support our perspective without us there. What? Like no one's pushing the U.S. perspective at doing close meetings except for like. So do we not have nobody. allies who agree with us? Like we have other powerful countries Dude, that okay, feel the same like, way we do. I, I'm 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 gonna let you ask a question. We only have like eight seconds. Oh, really? So how's your, how's your day been going? What time do you wake up? Earlier than that. <laughs> what time? <laughs> Can we see what part? What? Uh, the one that the Philippines disagrees with the U.S. Just give me a name. I don't know. You can push off that in cross. Philippines disagrees with you? Yeah, like, well, Philippines, Cambodia, disagree with our interpretation. I think it's like one. Start on their China contention. At the top, what you can find according to foreign policy in 06 is that China proclaimed that they would ignore every part of UNCLOS because they believe it is judicial activism. This comes at the top of our case when we tell you that China believes that since UNCLOS was like conceived before there was even any sort of text saying whether or not island building was legal or illegal, they view it as an illegitimate means of resolving the dispute in the South China Sea. Consequently, they proclaimed they would not listen to anything coming out of UNCLOS in terms of dispute resolution, meaning that anything UNCLOS could do would be essentially useless. What this means is that UNCLOS is an invalid mechanism in the eyes of the Chinese to resolve the dispute, and they are never going to listen to it. We have seen this historically. When UNCLOS has been used as a means to rule and fight against China, they simply ignored it and gone on with their business. We would also say that China has a direct incentive to do what they are doing right now because it, like, their hegemony is contingent on them expanding in the South China Sea. Therefore, my opponent's case is never going to actually happen. China isn't going to actually listen. But then, Let's go to the second, like, moreover, on the overarching case as a whole, we would say that their soft power solution is going to fail, and we should prefer hard power. In fact, what the Council on Foreign Relations found is that signing onto UNCLOS would jeopardize a lot of military exercises in the South China Sea, for example, freedom of navigation operations, the many military drills and surveillance exercises that we do right now. The reason why this is bad is because of Chen, uh, of, Chen of the Harvard University found that the, 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 what's essential in the South China Sea is that we are cooperating with our allies there in order to, like, do these drills together to reassure them and make them feel safe. Safer. That's the American security umbrella. So when these drills disappear, our allies feel less safe. That's when they decide to buy their own weapons. That's when they decide to militarize. And that's when tensions get uniquely worse. It's not a matter of them being at the table. They don't view diplomacy as a means of resolving the South China Sea dispute. They feel threatened by China's military. So their number one concern is the safety of their own country. Therefore, the military links in better. Then, finally, we would say they say this, they paint this picture of the status quo is a bad thing in terms of China's dispute resolution. We would say that's untrue. Because CNN, as of two months ago,
months ago reported that China has been fought, like has been signing on to many agreements with the ASEAN, his, uh, ASEAN institution, and we have found de-escalation in the South China Sea. So if anything, the conflict is getting better, not worse. Let's go to the specific warrants. First, I'm signaling confidence. So, to basically make this argument about legitimacy being increased, we would say, if anything, turning legitimacy towards UNCLOS is a bad means of dispute resolution because most countries in the South China Sea use UNCLOS through the tribunal, which we say is uniquely bad. The reason why this is true is because the tribunal says in every negotiation there must be only one winner. However, this is a really bad way of resolving disputes because when there's only one winner selected, China just says we're either going to ignore that or China gets angry and forced to posture. So, as a result, we would say the best diplomacy comes when two countries can walk away from the table and say, we both ended up winning. We both ended up coming away with something. UNCLOS does not allow that to happen. There can only be one winner in a court, and that is only going to worsen negotiations and worsen diplomacy. Then, second of all, they say that right now we are not there. UNCLOS is not pushing the interpretation of the signs of America. That is also untrue. In fact, the courts in 2014 ruled in favor of America and against China. China, like I told you before, chose to ignore that. That is not our fault, but it's China's fault because they're always going to ignore anything that comes out of UNCLOS. Then, Let's go to the second warrant on multilateralism. So, first of all, the Sydney, Mor the Sydney Morning Herald found that China substantially supports a lot of countries economically, and that's the warrant that K Shop gives in the crossfire. So, if countries are reliant on China for their economy, they're going to side with China either way, which is why this one country, Vietnam, the only one they can pull up in the entire South China Sea, is going to side with China no matter what. Of course, it's going to happen. They rely economically on China. Then, second of all, we would say in terms of multilateralism, ASEAN and UNCLOS are already used as a means of pushing back against China. Both of these in multilateral institutions disagree with China's interpretation on a law of the sea. The issue is, like I said before, China is never going to listen to them, and that is not our fault. Then, finally, we would decide, we would say that you can turn this argument against my opponents. Because if anything, if America used UNCLOS as a means of shifting multilateralism towards fighting China, and these disputes lasted years without any real resolution, we would shift away focus from important issues like overfishing and the environment. And what UNCLOS is one of the best, best multilateral institutions for fighting against climate change, so they would shift the focus away from the more important issues if they did this. Finally, on their impact, Shine News China finds that trade has not decreased and investor confidence is about the same as it was 10 years ago. So we would say their impact is not materializing as they say it is. We urge you to vote for the negative team. Can we see that last response here, Red, please? Yeah. Okay, so for everyone, I'm going to go over our case, and then I'm going to respond to their case. Are you ready? James's first response and rebuttal is from foreign policy. It says that China won't listen to anything no matter what happens, and that non unique's a lot of their case, because whether diplomacy succeeds or fails, nothing will happen according to them. Fortunately, our case is not about China. It is about getting every other country in the South China Sea to demilitarize because they are the ones paranoid that America is not doing anything. They miss the mark here. Then they say that we need to pursue hard power instead of soft power, but this is really dumb because the status quo is hard power. We have a huge amount of military warships stationed in the South China Sea, and that is the source of the tensions right now. That is why we 
Group, Biju Du Wang evidence that says that tensions are at an all-time high, trade confidence is at an all-time low, and America, since three days ago, is planning on moving its aircraft carriers into the region for the first time in 40 years. Things could not possibly be getting worse, and the solution is the one that they're advocating for. We are saying that we need to try something different for the first time in history. Then they say that China has been signing on to agreements with Asia, right? Which basically means that multilateralism is happening already. But James does not tell you what agreements they have signed on to. Conveniently, these agreements are about trade and multilateral financial agreements. This is because it's in response to American tariffs that just happened because of Trump, not military or territorial related treaties. Then he says that UNCLOS says that there's only one winner in a tribunal. We are not saying the tribunal is the way to go. In fact, the tribunal has already ruled against China, which means all of their impacts should have already happened. On the other hand, we are saying that it gives credibility to American negotiations when we sign on to the same international agreements that we wrote instead of condemning them. That is a unique offense for us. Then he says that multilateralism was already failing because ASEAN and the UN both have condemned China and nothing happened. What is something in common with both of these organizations? ASEAN and the UN both do not have America signed on to UNCLOS. That is really important because the gates of the diplomat from our case elaborates that the United States is the only actor in the world with enough resources, relationships, and power to diffuse tensions and bring about an enduring solution with international law. The reason that these multilateral solutions are failing is because we are not a part of them. Finally, he says that investor confidence is already high, but that's about the Trump trade war. It's not about the South China Sea in particular because that is not where most of our trade is happening. Now let's go to their case. Their first contention is about the South China Sea, and their first response is that the problem could not possibly be getting worse. The Wang evidence that we read you indicates that tensions are at an all-time high. We are barely even talking to China. The risk of miscalculation is extremely high in the status quo, and we are sending aircraft carriers for, again, the first time in over 50 years. The second response is that the tribunal has already ruled against China, and like James tells you in the rebuttal, quote, they just ignored it and went along with their business. That proves that they won't be posturing. That proves that there won't be backlash. It's just going to be the same thing that happens. Their terminal impact to zero. But third, China has literally come out and demanded that the United States accede to UNCLOS, so there's no way for them to posture in response to something that they want us to do. Then they say that when diplomacy fails, future diplomacy will be a waste of time. We're going to prove why A, future diplomacy won't fail, and B, why the status quo is what they are advocating for. All diplomacy right now has failed because America hasn't taken a serious seat at the table. Now let's go to the second contention about RP drilling. First, they say that affirming would grant the United States like some territory equal to the size of West Virginia, so I googled the size of West Virginia during like their prep time. It's really not that big. Second, Groves of the Heritage Foundation explained that the U.S. companies already have certainty in the Arctic drilling. They can just work through subsidiaries who are other countries that have already signed onto UNCLOS. They've already talked to Sweden about doing something like this. But third and most importantly, according to The Guardian, the chief of the world's energy watchdog has warned that drilling for oil in the Arctic is not yet commercially viable, and it would probably need to wait at least 30 years for this to happen because the Obama administration simply has given up multiple different companies the green light to drill in the Arctic and none of them have taken it because A, they don't have the technology to break through the ice and B, it's simply not profitable. Now let's go to their impact. So first impact is about hurting the indigenous people. They never explain the probability of an oil spill here and we say that it's far more likely that this benefits the indigenous people. McLean of the Stanford University argues that under the 1971 Alaska Native Claims Settlement, all drilling that happens in the Arctic sends a huge amount of royalties to these tribes who then spend it on things like high school educations and social services. They literally cite a person named White Man. If you're going to listen to someone about what the natives actually want, you should be affirming the resolution. Now let's go to climate change. Singer explains that in order for us to make any meaningful dent in the amount of climate change that happens, we would need to reduce emissions by over 80% across the world. They do not meet this bright line, so we are the best team in terms of actually reducing food prices because we give you a scalar impact. The more tensions increase, the more trade decreases, and that causes food prices to spike. Right. So before Crossfire, <laughs> before Crossfire, and they shouldn't be complaining about how long these moderations are because it just gives them free prep time. Um, so, yes. Um, all right. So, what did we think of the rebuttals? What's something that someone noticed that like one rebuttal did, and the other rebuttal didn't do quite as well? And it's something super simple. Yes. Yeah, so he did a road map, and that's because he did, <laughs> and that's because his rebuttal covered both his case and um, the other team's case. There's something else that Max did in his rebuttal, and that says he largely numbered his responses compared to James's rebuttal, where James went, uh, you know, just kept reading and reading, and we didn't really know like where the responses started and ended. Max tried to make an effort. Granted, he wasn't like 100% good at this, but or, uh, sorry, he didn't do this 100% of the time. But he was very good at numbering responses. 
And I can guarantee you, for most of y'all, that probably made his rebuttal easier to flow with one, two, three. Now granted, he was still speaking very fast. Does anyone else um, have any comments, any thoughts about the rebuttals so far? Yes. Um, I don't know if I just didn't catch something, but I felt like James had a lot more sources than me. Okay. So James, <laughs> James has never heard that in his entire life. <laughs> <laughs> so James did work for this debate. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun fact. Better, better, better late than ever. James. Better late than ever. Um, all right. Anything else? Yes. I felt like James was a lot more responsive to. Uh, I, th I felt like James was just a lot more responsive to the actual argument than Max was. Like I feel like Max wrote a lot of the evidence. And did, no, no. I, I mean, I'm just saying what I thought. I felt that. It, my perception was that I felt like a lot more satisfied with James's rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. James's rebuttal is more responsive to the actual arguments, whereas Max mission. While his mission may have read more evidence that wasn't necessarily applied well to the individual arguments. Does everyone kind of agree with that? Or are, is there any differing like, views on it? Yes. I have one more thing. There was also like a lot of repetition. I think in school, like mostly Max, but also both. Like he, he said the aircraft carriers maybe like four times in his rebuttal. So that was like, didn't need to spend that much time on it. Yeah, so efficiency, word economy, just like me in this moderation right now, saying the same things over and over again redundantly. Um, but yes, that's a big issue in debate, especially when you're underprepared, like both of these teams. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Both rebuttals were pretty much amazing. Both rebuttals were amazing. Yes, they were very good rebuttals. Yeah, one last comment. Yes, Mats is very good at snark, and Mats is very good at this. Now his judge is going to come over and say, This is one thing I think is super duper important. Most people in this room should not try and be funny yet. I see a lot of like freshmen, sophomores, and junior debaters. They're like, oh, I saw this one really good kid do that, so I'm going to try and do the same thing. It almost always comes off as force. Because if you're not super duper good yet, what judges see, they're always like, mm, I'm kind of messing up arguments. And when you try and like add funny on top of it, it's like, but Jake, you had a debate first kid. <laughs> what ends up happening is the reason why you get some really good like seniors and you know folks that have just graduated or graduated a year or so ago are, are able to do that is because they're at a place where they're really comfortable in what they're doing. Like they're not really freaking out about it, they're just there in their element and their natural personality is then coming through. None of, if you know Max, none of that was forced. That's Max. Oh yeah. You know, you gotta be you. You can't try and be someone else. And that's why a lot of good debaters, they don't usually try to develop that until maybe halfway through their senior year when they're 100% at home in a debate round, then it's just fun, let's go do this. If you try and force it before you're at that level, it almost never works. Okay, so with that, let's go do second cross. expensive sources, develop the technology to drill there, and many companies have already expressed interest in doing so in the long term. That's our argument. I don't really understand that, but let's, okay. say, let's say that we... Our argument is that at some point, oil resources will be extracted, and it is better that we don't do that and use green energy instead, because you will prolong the effects of climate change. Okay, so then I guess, can I ask about green energy? Sure. Well, are we doing it? Not yet, no. All right, so what's up? <laughs> okay, the reason why we don't do green energy is because fossil fuels are cheaper. 
can we agree that if we drill in the Arctic, we will keep oil prices lower for longer because of the way No, I don't really think so. I think wait, wait, that drilling in the Arctic would be able Does price increase or decrease? So I agree that you're increasing the supply, but I disagree that drilling in the Arctic will be equally as profitable as drilling It elsewhere. won't be as profitable, but if we don't drill in the Arctic, oil prices will skyrocket, whereas if we start drilling there, so, they will so keep the oil price at where it is gonna when happen? drilling begins. When's it going to happen? Well, first of all, companies have already expressed drilling in the status quo, but even if it doesn't begin whoa, soon... Whoa, 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 whoa. So they're drilling. The evidence in summary. So no, they're, they're drilling. They're not drilling yet. Trump opened just, up... What did you just say, though? Trump opened up areas... You got this on video, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Trump opened up areas in Alaska and the Arctic Circle to drilling, and companies have already begun exploiting those areas. All right, but, play it back. You just said but, that. Our <laughs> argument is not that drilling begins tomorrow. Our argument is that if America can defend their claim, drilling will begin someday, and drilling someday is bad, period. Wait, so Obama also gave gre the green light to Shell to drill in 2015. Why haven't they No, started? Obama actually banned all drilling. The, like, yeah, that's months because later. a few months later, because A, Shell specifically said they didn't have the technology, B, they didn't want to risk an wait, oil wait, spill. technology improve over time? Yeah, not so in three years. Eventually our evidence from wait, the Guardian wait, wait. says Our that argument is not that we're going to drill tomorrow. Our argument okay, is that in the fine. next decade or two, we will drill and we should not be doing that. Okay, then my response to that is A, that the technology isn't going to come in the next decade or whatever before peak oil, and B, and more importantly, that we can do it already with subsidiaries, and C, okay, apparently, well, let's we're already doing it. Let's talk Actually, when you work with two... Question? Yeah, sure. Wait, I, you just asked a question. Uh, <laughs> when, you, when you work through two countries at once, how many times do you get taxed? Um, it's still once. On no, you get... No, 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 not on royalties, on ta like domestic corporate taxes. You get taxed by the subsidiaries, and then the ISA comes back and taxes you too. Yeah, the ISA only taxes the one company that has royalties. No, that's not, that's not the way subsidiaries work. And David, who wait, understands how do the ISA well, tax us? We're not on an argument. We'll explain this in summary. Oh, yeah, yes. wow. okay. Wait, this so they're really quickly taking crap. Everyone, this is an example of a crossfire that was like heated and it was funny and comical, but it wasn't disrespectful. And that's the nuance. It can be funny, Max can crack jokes, James can crack some jokes back. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're always respectful and nothing was said in this crossfire that'll make Max or James hate each other and shut the rounds. Wait, can we get some quiet for a few China, I'd probably go on their side for it, because then oil is going to come back, and that's going to be on our side. Is everybody ready? Nope. Recognize that their entire case is contingent upon Uncle's being good, and the reason why is that the status quo of these countries already opposed China with the United States. But that means that if these countries are collaborating with the United States in the status quo, they need to prove that UNCLOS is a unique good dispute with mechanism. They don't do that, but we would say that the status quo is solving with hard power. This is the CNN evidence that James Richard's rebuttal that they don't talk about. In 2018, there was a code of conduct signed between the United States, the ASEAN nations, and China that was not a trade deal that led to an increase in stability in the South China Sea. Insofar as hard power and the status quo is solving better than the world they are talking about, there is no reason that they gain any unique offense here. But second, if you don't buy that, you can also look to the fact that when they talk about the tribunal ruling, they say that the tribunal ruling already happened. We say that the reason that UNCLOS is a uniquely bad diplomatic form and a reason to vote for us is because the United States wasn't there in 2016. That's really important because if the United States is seen as carrying the torch for diplomacy in the South China Sea, when we go to UNCLOS with China and it fails, that is where you uniquely see the United States as a failing actor, and that is a reason why. UNCLOS is not a unique good reason for diplomacy, it is a unique bad reason for diplomacy, and it's against the progress that we are making in the status quo. On to oil. Max reads a bunch of responses here. The first one is about West Virginia. There's one-fifth of the oil and gas there right now. That's not really applicable. The second is about subsidiaries. They don't understand the front line. The front line is that they have to pay taxes in Sweden and in the United States. And because of that taxation burden, that causes companies to not engage in subsidiaries. It's not about the ISA, but they also apply taxes, so that's a free front line for us. But then third, he talks about tech and profit. These are interlinked because when tech gets better, profit goes up. We would say that right now the Saudis are feeling domestic pressure, and they have said that in order for them to sustain their social programs, they need to up oil prices to $100 by 20 by whenever they want their social programs. 
That's really important because when the price of oil goes up, that leads to more drilling in the Arctic becoming more profitable. And right now, it only needs to be $78 a barrel at 68 right now. When we see profit going up, companies are going to go in. That's really important because James tells you that companies are chomping at the bit. But insofar as it's a really big investment, they need the legal certainty in order to go into the Arctic. That is where we link into our case. That's really important because when we link into our case, we tell you there will be a five degree increase in climate change in the Arctic. That's where we link into our impacts about developing countries and the harms of climate change going there. They try to say that we'll switch to renewables you went to 420 and, okay, going there. and then we said that when you switch to renewables, you slow down the switch to renewables when you increase the supply and tech gets better. <coughs> emissions by 80% to even have a noticeable debt in the total climate change in the world. The Peters evidence tells you that keeping global warming below two degrees even is impossible, uh, even without like, the increases in oil drilling that they talk about. So they really don't read the bright line to have any sort of impact. But now let's go to our case. The first thing that he extends is the CNN evidence that says that there is an agreement that we signed with ASEAN that is fixing things. First of all, the Wong evidence says that the risk of miscalculation in armed conflict is at an all-time high. Just three days ago, we were planning to send, in, uh, send aircraft carriers into Vietnam. But the second thing is the evidence that they read you is literally from today. There's no way that they can noticeably show you that there's been any, there's been any increases or decreases in tensions. So prefer our Wong evidence because it says the tensions are, are in all time high. The second thing he says is that if the U.S. is there when tribunals fails, that's actually a bad thing. But first of all, we tell you that we don't have to actually use tribunals. That's why the Truman evidence says that as China continues to expand their territorial claims, it relies on economic muscle to prevent other South China Sea nations from even bringing claims to the treaty. So even before the tribunal, there were problems with Chinese influence in UNCLOS. So when the U.S. enters those agreements and talks to these countries, they will do things outside of these tribunals that will actually decrease the influence that China has you know, on like sea trade and stuff like that. Now the second thing that you want to extend is the Gates evidence that says that the United States is the only actor in the world with that power to do those things with these other countries. And the French evidence concludes that the more that China sees a coordinated response to its military buildup, build the more likely it is to turn towards diplomacy, which is what we advocate for now. This is important because the World Bank evidence concludes that the last time
time that food prices spiked in 2010, 44 million people entered extreme poverty. And we tell you that when tensions with China increase, trade has always decreased. A 1% increase in tensions decreases trade by 0.05%. Now, we outweigh their impact because our impact is actually a scalar impact. Even if tensions increase a little bit, we tell you that food prices increase a little bit. They, Their impact, on the other hand, is a bright line impact because they have to meet their bright line of the two degrees and the 80% to have any sort of actual impact. So with that being said, there is no way that signing onto the treaty actually makes them reach that global warming a bright line, but our scalar impact still holds. And for those reasons, I strongly urge a vote for the affirmative. So I think I have a first question. Can you skip the audience? I'll do grand and then we'll do OK, so just so I understand correctly, the uniqueness in your case is that when we affirm and accede to UNCLOS, we accede to UNCLOS, and then we do diplomacy outside of UNCLOS because we acceded to UNCLOS. No, not outside of UNCLOS, outside of tribunals. Does UNCLOS do that? Has that ever happened? Dude, UNCLOS is not just a like gateway to tribunals. It's also an organization where discussions happen okay. between. Wait, wait, wait. So, so, so are we not discussing with countries country. in the yeah, South like, China Sea and You guys got to do better than that. You guys got to do a lot better than that, guys. Because America works directly with the ASEAN organization okay. to do the exact whoa, same whoa, whoa, thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The if that's the case, then why did your evidence that you handed me explicitly say that America wasn't involved in that ASEAN treaty? What do you hold mean? On, hold on. It's like if America <laughs> works with ASEAN, then why did you hold just on. hand me evidence that's, that says where, that they signed the agreement without America? That. This discussion is kind of like, my, my question is specifically, can you specifically show us UNCLOS leading to a new multilateral forum ever? Yeah. Wait, when? What do you think UNCLOS is? Do you think it's just a tribunal? No. You realize, asking, that, there, you okay. realize that there's a general assembly asking, of 167 on. members I'm that meets five years. I'm asking you if it's ever right? worked. Yeah, well, A, oh, it so has we give you historical B, evidence that China previously, when they sit down multilaterally with the U.S., it has worked. <laughs> okay, yes. but you need to give well, me that UNCLOS is specific to the U.S. Wait, wait, not even, been no, it doesn't wait, need wait. to be specific to the United States. Can I talk account. for a second yes. and I'll let James talk? Yeah. The reason that we can't give you that evidence is because the U.S. has never been in UNCLOS and we're the only country with the military and economic might to get those agreements done. Okay, when a country feels like they're opposing China, do they feel that America's on their side or not? Right? It doesn't matter. They really, can't that's take... your argument. Your argument is that countries feel alone. Do they no, no, feel no, no, James, alone James, or James, not James, in the status quo? James, they feel alone in the sense that they can't bring those claims to the General Assembly or to the UNCLOS negotiations because America Wait, is so in the is about about claims. claims. But this brings us back to the terminal defense that James reads in rebuttal, which says that China says they will never listen to UNCLOS dispute resolution because they don't believe in compulsory arbitration. None of that matters. Yes, it's not it about does. what the results of the tribunals are. It's the fact that these countries feel that the U.S. is there to back okay. them up. Wait, wait, wait. Countries don't okay, think America on. opposes China right now. Which country thinks but that? If you're no, one one country. Vietnam, Cambodia. Okay. Okay. Vietnam thinks that America is pro-China. Okay. But if no. you're no. Wait, hold on. Let me get this. It's not about the U.S. being pro-China. It's about the U.S. not being so, there to back so the Vietnam. Vietnam thinks thing. that if they try so, to say China, you're wrong, America will be like, no, China, you're right. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Right, so let's talk about drilling, right? Sure. Yep. You say that like profit will go up tremendously, and that's why the incentive exists to drill. So then yes. why is the subsidiary the turn to that? Wait, this wasn't in summary. But also, wait, what do, you, what do you mean? Like profit will go up substantially? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. when tech gets better, profit goes up. Yes. Right, and so if that's true, then why is like this small tax on subsidiaries going it's to It's not a small, small tax. tax. Well, how much like is America's it? corporate tax I think it's 25% like right profit. now in America, and then it's like <laughs> another like whatever. Wait, but Sweden the corporate has. tax is going to happen either way. Yes, yeah, yeah, but then you have to pay it in Sweden, and then you have to pay it in the United yeah, States. Yeah, so I'm asking what the Swedish one is. Doubling the amount of taxes is higher than America. We did to oh, no. drilling. It's like more taxes. Yeah. All right. Well, and also, you guys drop it. <laughs> okay, so while well, James is prepping his final focus, here are some here are some thoughts and some just like some general things that I'd like to throw out from flowing both summaries. So. The first thing to notice is with the evidence exchange that happened um, between the summaries, Milburn reading their CNN or um, their evidence about um, tensions declining right now, and something that is very common in a debate round, especially at high level debate rounds, is that there's a high propensity for um, evidence power tagging, which is exactly what Mission pointed out. And that's why we all need to be careful with their e with how we cite evidence and making sure that claims and assertions that we can take from evidence are not too outlandish or too out like left field or right field of what the evidence actually says. Now, there's a few mistakes that both sides made, I think, in their summaries. In terms of Milburn's summary, Milburn didn't really frontline their turn on impact one, although then again, mission didn't go for that turn, even though it could have been a very clean path to the ballot. 
um, in a very messy debate right now. They also, more importantly though, is that Milburn doesn't frontline the Brightline response on their impact too, which might be a little bit problematic, um, and term, might, might be a little bit problematic for them when doing impact calc. But does anyone have any thoughts in terms of like which link story or which argument in terms of its warranty might be um, easier to comprehend right now? Yeah. Well, I liked uh, what they said about hard power being solvent and status quo, and yeah. like how there's not conflict in not a lot of conflict in South China Sea right now, and I don't think they respond to that very well. Yeah. So I would just the last general comment to make is that. Um, while both team, while the probably mission does a better job in the impact level, actually explaining their terminal impact, albeit they read new impact evidence in the second summary, um, and Milburn doesn't extend a terminal impact in the first summary on what how, why climate change is important. Mil Milburn probably has a way cleaner link and better explained link in the summary. <coughs> Starting on China, the first response David extends is that we are already part of ASEAN and UNCLOS. The reason this is important is what I told you in Grand Crossfire. No country feels alone right now when they stand up against China. They're never going to think America isn't behind their back, which means in either world, this idea of multilateralism occurring is not happening. We would say the unique part of UNCLOS is the dispute resolution, which always is bad, like we tell you in our case. That goes dropped. Then, second of all, we would say that hard power is solving better in the status quo. We have signed the most monumental agreement between ASEAN and China on a rules-based order and de-escalating the tensions that are occurring right now. Even though it just happened yesterday, we would say that is key. The reason why hard power is uniquely better than soft power is because when we do cooperative drills with countries in the South China Sea, they feel reassured. They don't feel reassured by one piece of paper. They feel reassured when America can sail their ships into the South China Sea and say, hey, we're going to work with you on these military drills. We are going to protect you. Under UNCLOS, America legally can no longer do that. Countries feel unsafe. Then, finally, like David tells you, China is never going to listen to any dispute resolution coming out of UNCLOS, meaning they are doomed for failure. They are never going to solve anything. With that in mind, let's move to drilling. The water spots, which they claim we didn't front line is this idea on climate change being like this idea of a bright line needing to be accessed. That's not true. What David tells you is first of all, we do access a unique change in climate change. The evidence they drop is that there will be a five degree shift if there were to be drilling in the Arctic, and that is a massive shift. And second of all, what David also tells you is that climate change is a scalar impact. He didn't elaborate, but what David basically means is that like climate change can always get worse, right? Like each degree of warming will make climate change much worse. What we tell you in our case is that one degree of warming will worse will like de decrease food production by 78%, and that is absolutely key. So at the end of the day, we tell you the only world in which drilling occurs, according to Gardner, is one in which we sign on to UNCLOS. And this is going to outweigh the entire China debate for three reasons. First of all, on strength of link. One piece of paper is not going to influence the China debate a lot. One country drilling is going to when there is a five degree shift involved. That is a much stronger link than my opponents. Then, second of all, on magnitude. We would say we're accessing a much bigger impact. Because their impact, first of all, is specific to the South China Sea, whereas climate change affects the entire world and the entire developing countries. And second of all, we are accessing a 74% decrease in food production for each degree shift, whereas they can only give you this nebulous impact of potential tensions worsening one day of shipping. We say we have a much cleaner impact. We urge you to go for the negative team. Seven point seven point. What? It's seven point four, not seven point. I mean, I'm just going to leave it. Uh, we have 40 seconds. China, that's just it. Only China. Everything China. Okay. First, they say that we're already part of Asia and UNCLOS. A, we're not part of UNCLOS. And B, Asia stands for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Last time I checked, we're not in Southeast Asia. We are not part of these agreements. And let me read the piece of evidence that they handed me that they said, apparently, we signed on to this awesome treaty that did all these awesome things. It says, quote, 
to, to ease tension and manage the conflict. Asia and China have been holding talks for over a decade, and that is really important because our Wang evidence indicates that right now, today, tensions are at an all-time high. America, for the first time in 40 years, is going to send aircraft carriers into the region, which is a sign of war, and that is important because they are saying that hard power sold, but how, hard power has been the solution that we have been using for the last decade, and the problem has only gotten worse. They have no evidence as to why voting for them would change the problem at all. We have the risk of offense because the current solution is failing, and we can at least try to make it better, and we are the only team that really has any attempt to do that. Then they also just say that in general, that like we don't really want to change China's mind, but again, they missed the mark on our link chain. We say that when we enter these talks and when we back up these countries in the unclosed forum, that they feel less safe, or that they feel more safe, and that means that they don't need to militarize themselves. Countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, these countries are the ones that are building up their militaries and causing tension in the South China Sea. But the second link is just going to be that multilateralism works. Now, they say that like China won't ever willingly cede the ground, but our argument is that multilateralism coerces them into doing so through economic and financial and political pressure. Also, even if it doesn't work, just the fact that we are trying to have these talks is probably enough to give us a link into tensions decreasing, and that is really important because our impact is about perception. The Tang evidence says that a one-point increase in the tension score decreases trade by 0.5%, and that is important because all the money that is flowing in the South China Sea is going to contain huge volumes of trade, around 30% of the entire world's trade. That drives food prices up and could push 44 million people into poverty. Now, here's the weighing. No matter what they do, they try to frame their impact as a scalar one, but no matter what we do, if we don't meet the brink for an 80% reduction in emissions, their impacts will happen in either world. Climate change is going to look the same. It'll just look the same maybe five years faster. On the other hand, we have a very clear link into an actual scalar impact about food prices decreasing, and that is going to be key because we are pulling millions out of poverty out of that potential way. They really don't have offense. All their impacts happen anyways. All right, who would have voted for the pawn? Who would have voted for the pro? What's the ballot? That's like, all right, wait, I, we should count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, cool, half one. I would have voted after you. Cash money right here.